Um, welcome to the second week of talks in the GQ Spring webinar series. We're having these every Wednesday throughout February and March. The goal is to share the research of our principal and get investigators that have been funded under our new GQ's five-year award. So thanks for joining us today. My name is Chris Simonello, and I'm the Outreach and Education Manager for GQ's. I'll be moderating today's session, which Jen has already started the recording. Thanks, Jen. Um, she'll also be helping me to monitor the questions that you can write in the chat. We're a relatively small group, so please feel free to raise your hand and use uh, the microphone. You can come off um, speaker if you'd like to, to ask questions. We will be having time for questions following each speaker. It's my pleasure to introduce our two speakers today. First up is Philemon Gallinillo. Most of you know him. He's been with GQs for many years. In addition to being the GQs co-data manager and systems architect, he's an enterprise IT expert working on various projects at the Heart Research Institute for Gulf of Mexico Studies at Texas A&M Corpus Christi. He's got more than three decades of local, national, and international experience designing, developing, and deploying information systems. And he designed the GQs data portal back in, geez, 2008, Philemon? Was it before that? <laughs> Around 2008. And he's been, since then, maintained, upgraded, and curated its content. So probably nobody knows the system better than Philemon and um, Bob Currier, who's also on our call today. So today, he'll be focusing on work with the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, or BESI. And specifically, he'll be working on the notice to lessees ADCP data. And his talk is titled, where are the data from the oil and gas industry in the Gulf of Mexico? And following Philemon's talk, I'll introduce our second speaker, John Langan. So all yours, Philemon. Okay, I was trying to get myself unmuted. Okay, I'll, I'll let me try to share the screen now. Put it on uh, presentation mode. I'm almost certain that most of you that are on this particular call have seen this particular presentation or, or at least a part of it. So I will try to make this as simple as possible uh, and uh, uh, not getting into the technical weeds of the development. The uh, presentation is titled, Where are the data from the oil and gas industry in the Gulf of Mexico? This, uh, a uh, very simple title there, and I can easily answer that in one minute, but I will not do that, but rather present to you how we actually did it. When we talk about the oil and gas industry, uh, uh, we refer to those particular structures that are uh, still within the US EEZ or the Economic Exclusive Zone, uh, where uh, we have a lot of activities related to uh, the oil and the gas uh, harvest. And all of these platforms that are there um, are largely located at the outer coast, uh, what do you call this, OCS, uh, outer continental shelf. I'm running out of <laughs> words here. Some of these platforms are in modus form or ship drillings. Some of them are semi-submersible and some of them are deployed using uh, some fixed buoy stations. Now, from this particular slide, you will see that there are a lot of red dots and, uh, and a couple of green dots. The red dots, these are the stations that have shared their data uh, since the beginning of the particular of this program. And, um, and the green ones are the ones that are active. You might be wondering, why are there so many red ones? Well, some of those stations that, the, or platforms had been uh, decommissioned. Some of them are temporarily closed and some of them even are uh, probably are under in uh, under maintenance mode or things associated to uh, what you call a uh, temporary closure of sort. And the green ones are the active ones. So uh, to date, we have 37 organizations are participating in this particular program. That's quite a quite a big number. So there's a lot of organizations out there that, that does business in the outer continental shelf uh, that are willing to share or sharing their data. In total, we are monitoring of uh, about 135 stations with 41 currently active platform. Now, just to, just a little bit of a history here, uh, as far as the BASI and NTL, you might be wondering what NTL is. 
NTL is a notices to leases and operators. It's, it's a document that is being provided by BESI that actually stipulates a lot of things. Uh, it can, it, NTL is just not one document, but a couple of them. And in one of the documents that they have, uh, they specify the requirements of these offshore leases to provide oceanographic data. Before GCOS came into the action, uh, the National Data Buoy Center, I think I, I thought I saw the word uh, Don Petriatis here, she would know better than me with regards to this. Uh, NDBC was the one uh, designated to receive all the data from the NTL stations. Uh, in 2019, a discussion have started with NOAA and BES, uh, with NOAA, BESI, and GQS uh, to start working on the migration of this particular function to GQS. In 2020, GQS initiated a parallel run with NDBC just to make sure we have all the uh, necessary requirements uh, for us to run this operation uh, automatically or uh, without interruptions. Now in uh, 2021, all the functions were migrated to GQS in and around March of 2021 actually. To date, we have all the uh, uh, functions that were required uh like the user registration data upload services the the presentation of the data or publication of the data uh through the web accessible folder or any other data endpoints out there that will i'll talk more about those later on and they're all fully functional and the system is fully operational to date uh, we are currently at the moment receiving and processing up to 20 gigabytes of data per year of raw data and the rate of increase is somewhere around four gigabytes per year. So this is increasing, uh, hopefully it's not exponentially, but it is really increasing uh, at that particular rate per year. And it is uh, you know, quite interesting to see how big the data are coming in. The bandwidth utilization also is increasing, uh, meaning to say a lot of people are accessing the data. So to the average of about four terabytes a month, and uh, we can see a, a, uh, uh, a rate of increase of about 0.2 terabytes per month. So somebody is really accessing data you know, on a regular basis from this particular repository. Now, how does the data flow uh, uh, to our repository in GQS? Now, let me see. I hope you can see my my pointer here from the data source what what normally happens is that the data provider would will be provided with some kind of an sftp account where they can push it uh, to a particular server this is called the uploads the chico.org server and and this particular data is being pulled but yet another server uh, that will parse the data and process do the qaqc and put it on data services and the, the data themselves should also be pulled to yet a third server called the data the GQS.org. This is the primary data portal of GQS, where the data, the QC data, will now be published on the data services. So there are two WAF here, web accessible folder. One is under the NCL, and the other one is under the, uh, the general data portal of GQS. And there is also the WAF, uh, there's also the ERDAP data endpoint that can also be used to pull the data. And all of this data, the intent really is to archive it onto NCI. So that's the data flow. It's quite simple. And yet you can see that there are three different servers that are involved in the whole process. One that takes care of the uploading the data, one that does the processing, one is dedicated to publishing. The architecture itself is also a little bit, uh, I, I, will, I will not say complicated, but involves a lot of servers. We, we make sure that all of our servers in our server form in GQS uh, are mirrored or we have alternate servers just in case one of the servers goes down, the alternate server take over. So this is to ensure 24 seven uh, availability of data services. So it goes all the way from the upload services, the end all processing, uh, the servers within the Texas A&M Corpus Christi. We also have a whole bunch of servers in Texas A&M in College Station. 
uh, before we only had one layer and the problem we had with one layer of architecture is that if one of the servers goes down the whole service goes down and it is it has become uh you know a uh, sort of a problem whenever the server goes down uh, because a lot of people were working with modeling or have engineering issues or have some uh, rescue needs and that they need the data they need it asap and we cannot provide that immediately if there's uh, if there's a hardware issues or communication issues so with this kind of architecture where, where we always double our hardware and network services uh, we we can safely say that we have a 24 7 availability it's still we still go down though uh, like last week uh, we had some uh, uh, some security patches that we have to incorporate and uh, suddenly one service went down so it's not really foolproof yet, but we're 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 getting to it. And these are the 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 three latest servers that that joined the family. So I, I did mention something about the web accessible folder. Uh, and and before I do that, uh, just going back to this one, I, I did mention that all of our data are accessible via the web accessible folder, uh, which is really like. Uh, something that a lot of scientists are aware of or, or, or familiar with, they go to a particular website, they download the file that they need. As far as the web accessible, accessible folder uh, format is concerned, we start, uh, we do publish all the raw data here. We have all the raw data that is being submitted uh, to us are, 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 are archived and stored here in this particular folder. We convert all of them to two different forms. One is the NetCDF format, and they're all stored here on the NC folder. And we also convert them into a comma-separated value type of file. And this is uh, today. This is the heaven. This is the folder that is heavily used. I don't know why, but uh, why CSV is the more popular than the NetCDF. But I guess uh, a, a lot of people are much more familiar with that structure than NetCDF. So once you get into the WAF folder, you will you will see all the platforms out there, the NTL platforms uh, that are contributing data to us, and the da their data are segregated into a year basis and on also on a monthly basis. So uh, and then you can get to the NetCDF file or to the CSV file or to whatever files you want or in the WAF. So that's the WAF structure that we have here. Now the other data endpoints that we have is uh, that I mentioned earlier is the GQS AirDub. The AirDub services that we have, uh, we have about five different AirDub services, but two of them are really uh, dedicated for uh, NTL uh, publication of NTL data. And the first one is the primary data portal uh, that serves near real time data, and it's the AirDub, the GQS.org server. And uh, we do publish all the NetCDF data in this particular data endpoints. And we invite you to come in and uh, harvest data as you, see, uh, as you see fit. Now, just a little, bit of, a, a little bit of a warning is that whenever you, you access data uh, through, the, through the AirDAV, you might think it's a small one, but be mindful that when you do your selection that these data are really deep. There's a lot of compilation. One month of data from one NTL station can go to about 56 uh, or even 100 megabytes of data. It's just for one month. So if you're going to download three years of data, uh, that will be quite a load. Okay, that will be quite a load. Uh, some of them are really, really, really huge. So be careful with that because they're huge simply because the ADCP deployment, that's the current measure of currents, they can go all the way down to 3,000 meters. So if you're going to calculate the num number of data that is being remitted, and if they're doing a, uh, uh, a reading all down to 3,000 meters, and they're sending data every 20 minutes, just think about the, the, the amount of data that is being stored on a one month uh, of data. This is it's really huge. So be, be mindful about when you download those data. This is... Uh, this is a uh, for in situ observing systems in near real time. Now, I, I did mention earlier uh, that 
we started in 2020. Then one of the big questions or one of the more common questions that I, I do get is what happens to those data that are before 2020? We did, we did manage to capture all of this data, imported them onto the GQs, and we did extra QAQC to them uh, through another funded project called the Gulf Hub. I don't know whether you're familiar with it, but Gulf Hub was funded by the National Academies of Science, and we did a lot of manual QAQC to them. And these data are also available in one of our uh, ERDA service endpoints that is on GQS5. GQS5 is the term that idiot with the slide heard of. Uh, you can go there and download the data. So there we have a we have over a thousands data of the NTL stations that we re, de decided to reprocess and do a manual QAQC uh, to it. So you're 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 welcome to download all of them. And they're also very huge amount. Uh, these are really huge data collections. And and to that, I would say uh, you're welcome to go to our data portal, download whatever you can, and uh, I'm open to questions. Uh, Chris? Thanks, Philman. Perfect. Plenty of time. We've got lots of time for questions if anybody has any. You could raise your hand. You can write it in the chat box. Brian, yes. Hi, Philemon. Uh, I've had some experience with these data um, when I worked for the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, and this topic has come up again, um, the ADCP data on the offshore oil and gas rigs, because there's a potentially equivalence with uh, similar deployments that are slated to occur for offshore wind uh, installations. And uh, because of that, there's some opportunities, I think, for, for lessons learned and um, doing it you know, even better the next time. Uh, one of the issues that I encountered when I worked at BOEM with uh, these data sets um, were, were some uh, pretty significant data quality issues uh, stemming, at least uh, it was my understanding, from the instruments not being uh, fully maintained by the offshore oil and gas operators on their rigs or them not being you know, mounted or installed correctly. In any case, I was wondering if you could comment um, about the, the data quality issues that you've experienced from this data set and then moreover, um, any advice that you would have, uh, caveats for using this data set or uh, for other similar efforts um, in the future? Okay, that's a very nice question, Brian. Uh, nice to see you again. Well, as far as the data is concerned, the, uh, the problems that we uh, have experienced is really from the beginning, it starts with the installation. Some of them, they do install the, uh, the ADCP incorrectly. And we know very well that if you mount the ADCP close to uh, large iron filings, you will have some uh, interference from the magnetic uh, uh, attributes of, of, of the whole environment, and you don't really get the real readings of current. Uh, 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 yeah, I would say the insulation was the number one problem that we had. Uh, so. To resolve that particular issue, it is very important that whoever installs the ADCPs for the next sets of structure, that they should be aware of all these problems uh, so that they can have some sort, some sort of a guidelines on where to install them. The other problem that I have is uh, that we experience is that some of this, but uh, some of this installation, not necessarily for wind because I don't think they're gonna be moving, is that some of these modules we call the uh, mobile oil drilling units that uh, does harvest the data, they, they move around sometimes. And uh, there are some uh, data providers that they do not report uh, the lat long or the position of those, uh, of those things. And we have to go down to some of the binary files to see what is the real reading. So that's the other problem that we encountered. And if uh, you, we will have uh, this particular situation in the future, it is extremely important. They, they also report a lot long uh, from their ADCP instruments, that they should report those things as well. Okay, the, the, the third problem I had has to do with the personnel uh, of the data providers. There are so many of these data providers and there is a very high turn of uh, uh, personal change. Uh, Okay, let me just uh, stop sharing first my uh, 
I don't know if you can see me though. Uh, I can I can see you, and now you've uh, stopped screen sharing. So I, I your, said, okay. your posted stamp tile got even bigger there for the moment. <laughs> so anyway, uh, on the, my the, screen. yeah, I, I, the, the the rate of change of the personnel also is a problem with me, in that if they have a change of person. They, they always have a tendency to change the way or the protocol or the procedure of sending the data to GPS. And that in that way, you know, we, we begin to go into a little bit what I call semi-panic no, no, uh, mode because the data are coming in the, in a different format, the data are coming in different frequency, that everything else changes. So we have to go in and train them again. And that was the, second, the, the, the third problem that we have is on the personal itself. And the fourth problem, actually is what you have alluded to earlier was the maintenance They're, they have no idea on how to maintain the instruments and how to keep it up up tick. that's why uh, we had on our qaqc under the quartz set we had the echo intensity which actually gives you a lot of uh what do you call this uh, a lot of uh, indications as to the quality of the instrument that are installed uh, we have other a ton of other problems out there, inclu uh, including the absence of the tilt angle and stuff like that. So it is very difficult. QAQZ had been a challenge before, but it has uh, for the new ones that are coming in. I don't think it is a problem, or but but in the previous ones, yes, it was a very big problem. But not on the uh, most recent readings because uh, we do talk to them and we. We give them a call and ask them how did you do this or how did you do that and things associated to it, trying to minimize the problem. Thank you for that. Uh, that's that's very helpful information for me. And at the, at the risk of monopolizing too much of this, I do have one more uh, follow-on question. You mentioned uh, the some of the challenges with um, turnover and staff and getting them to send data to you in a timely fashion. Um, are would you talk about how often these data are? Uh, transmitted to GQs. I'm, I'm assuming that the they are not uh, typically uh, like near real-time telemetry of the information coming off the ADCPs. Is, is that impression correct? Uh, yes and no. Some of them do send their data on a monthly basis, uh, on, on, a, on a daily basis. Some of them send data in a 20 minutes uh, interval, some of them in hourly interval. So it really depends, uh, but uh, by and large it is hourly. That they transmit the data to us and we process them immediately and publish them ah, so that really is a, a near real-time stream now yes That's it's great. very close to near real -time. yes it's a good uh we do encourage them to do that and we try to help them if they don't know how to do it we try to help them and even develop codes for them so that we can get them in near real time thank you Thanks, Brian. Any other questions for Philemon? I would be remiss if I didn't say, um, Dr. Jorge Brenner, Executive Director of GQS, regrets that he could not be here today, but at our April meeting in Mississippi, we will be talking about some ways that this work and other GQS resources can support some of that wind energy, wind energy um, need that's ramping up in the Gulf of Mexico. So we'll, we'll be continuing some of this discussion. Um, next up, we have John Langen. John received his master's degree in unmanned systems from Embry-Riddle Embry Aeronautical University. After that, he spent time at Florida Gulf Coast University, where he worked in the environmental engineering department. And in 2022, he joined Moat Marine Laboratory as a senior engineer and the manager of the Ocean Technology Program. Um, and I learned a lot more about John earlier on this conversation about his military background and fascination with jets and things. So I wish I would have known that prior to today's introduction, but you've had a fascinating history with um, technology ranging from air down into the deep sea. And so I'm looking forward to your talk today to learn more. Um, he couldn't have picked a more challenging time to start at Moat Marine Lab as Hurricane Ian upended so much along the Southwest coast of Florida. Today, he's gonna to share with us OTP's glider operations and programmable hyperspectral seawater scanners and the challenges his team is facing to get these instruments back online um, following the storm. His talk is titled Moat Marine Laboratory in GQS, Research Highlights and Lessons Learned Post-Hurricane Ian. And thanks so much for joining us today, John. Well, happy to be here. 
on Philemon. That was a fantastic presentation. So thank you for that. Um, and hopefully I can present one that is uh, equally as, as interesting. I'm going to share my screen. <clears throat> All right, are we working? Are we seeing the screen? Yes, yes. we still see your notes. How's that? No change. Right. Still seeing your notes in the sidebar? Okay. Well, ocean technology, and I can't seem to figure out computers. So sometimes I wonder how I did this. Um, In all fairness, he did have it perfect before this talk. <laughs> I did. I was seeing thumbnails, not the notes, if that helps any. Like you hadn't gone full screen. Okay. Thanks, well, Thanks for that again. clarification. Let's try that again. Let's go screen. And we're going to go screen two. Let me share that. Uh, it's not working. Jen, do you want to do you want Jen to advance the slides for you? Yeah. Is that working? Yes, that's yes, perfect. That's beautiful right yes. there. Okay. Fantastic. Great. Sorry about that delay. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is uh, my presentation for Moat Marine and Jikus. Uh, some of our research highlights and lessons learned post Hurricane Ian, uh, as Chris had mentioned earlier. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with ocean technology here at Moat, um, I'm John Langan, I'm the Senior Engineer and Program Manager. Um, my first day here at Moat was August 31st, 2022. So I have not yet made the five or the six month mark in the position. And um, we have a very small team here. I have a um, young ocean engineer named Riley McGuire uh, and Carl Henderson. I'm sure some of you are familiar with that name. Um, he's our legendary electrical engineer here at Ocean Technology. And we also have Greg Bird, who's uh, one of our boat captains, but he's also one of our certified glider pilots. Uh, and he helps on our glider operations as well. So we are a very small team. So what we do for GCUS is the uh, PT Federal Award number for Texas A&M, um, we are a subaward recipient uh, under that project um, with that subaward number. And that project title is called Continuing the Development of the Gulf of Mexico um, Ocean Observing System. And under that project, Ocean Technology, uh, our project objectives under that subaward consist of operation of the existing HAB Observatory, uh, which is a two-part uh, position where we maintain two programmable hyperspectral seawater scanners, which we affectionately call the FIS. Um, we maintain one at the New Pass dock here in Sarasota, and we were maintaining one at Estero Bay in Sanibel. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, the FIS sensor that was established here at New Pass uh, has been collecting data for 17 years, ever since the implementation of the original OPD uh, that was developed by Gary Kirkpatrick here. Um, the Sanibel sensor was uh, implemented in 2015, and it went down for uh, a number of months. I'm not sure why, um, but we were able to um, redeploy the FIS sensor in Estero Bay in Channel Marker 2 uh, in September prior to the Hurricane Ian. Uh, unfortunately, the hurricane wiped uh, both of those sensors out. Um, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, the second part of the, uh, the operation for existing uh, harmful algal blooms observatory is maintaining uh, Moat's existing fleet of underwater autonomous vehicles, um, of which we have a G2 Slocum electric glider and we have a G3S um, Slocum electric glider. Um, with those, we will conduct three glider operations a year for GCUS. Uh, and I can confidently say that I just secured yesterday the funding to purchase a third glider. Um, so we'll have a, a third glider in our, um, in our fleet that will be able to produce more missions as well. And the third part of what we do for GCUS is the augmentation of the existing HAB observing system. 
Um, and that encompasses the developing or the continuing develop, continuing to develop the, the FIS uh, C or compact model, which is a smaller size sensor um, that will hopefully have a longer deployment time than the current uh, sensor we have out there. So while we maintain two programmable hyperspectral seawater scanners or FIS, um, some of the accomplishments uh, that we have had so far in our short tenure here, because my ocean engineer started at the same time I did, we did success successfully redeploy the Estero Bay sensor uh, in September of 2022. The hurdles we had were Hurricane Ian, nonstop um, ever since then. So Namestorm Ian wiped out both of uh, Ocean Technologies sensors. Um, the one at Nupes uh, suffered flooding. Uh, that one has been rebuilt and redeployed. And the Estero Bay sensor suffered a total loss of topside controls, um, as well as flooding inside the canister from torn cabling as well. Now, Ocean Technologies worked to rebuild the sensors, uh, completing one, um, which I just said was redeployed. Um, the Sanibel sensor was not recovered, um, or was not covered under insurance, uh, but we are finalizing the build of our third FIS sensor to replace it. Um, and during the build of that sensor, it suffered um, a malfunction of the waveguide. The quartz portion of the waveguide actually cracked, and we needed to send that in to be um, repaired. And we, we were able to do that, so we got that back. And we've got that second FIS sensor rebuilt, and it currently undergoing uh, bench testing, uh, which it passed, and some leak tests that um, we've implemented here um, to make sure that when we deploy the sensor, we don't suffer catastrophic leaks um, is right after deployment. So we leak tested here on the bench, and now we're going to go ahead and redeploy that. So we are um, looking to get that deployed within the next two weeks. Um, we're going to do that in coordination with uh, Santa Bell Captiva Conservation Foundation um, and piggyback off some of their mounts on um, Channel Market 2 in New Sterile Bay. The biggest lesson that we learned um, during this is that prior to the arrival of a named storm, Ocean Technology is going to take the time to go and remove our sensors. Um, with the whirlwind of operations that were going on, being new to the position um, and the learning curve, and then the um, confusion of what was going on with the storm, uh, it never occurred to go out and pull the sensors out of the water. Uh, so that one is, has gone into the books, and that is something that will uh, continually happen from now on. And the second part is maintaining our existing fleet of underwater um, gliders. Uh, so we have, uh, again, we have a successful uh, glider deployment, um, unit number eight, uh, 893 for two missions uh, in September 22 for 14 days, and then we did it again in October 2022 for 15 days. Uh, the September glider mission was conducted uh, during our first week on the job. Uh, now, myself, I hadn't uh, put my hands on a Slocum glider for about 10 years. I originally um, was introduced to them in Australia, at the University of Western Australia, at the Australian National Facility for Ocean Gliders. Their lab was right next door to mine. And it was really, really interesting working um, with them on that. And my young ocean engineer, Riley, had never uh, touched a glider. So it was, uh, it was a very happy day for us, two happy days, when we were able to deploy the glider in September, recover it, and then redeploy it again in October for 15 days. And that um, particular mission was interesting because we flew it down south, and then we turned it in towards Charlotte Harbor. And we gathered a, a lot of really interesting um, data on that that we're still in the process of analyzing. Unfortunately, uh, during the preparations for the hurricane, Glider 555 suffered a broken rudder. Um, we were able to 3D print a new rudder. However, when we installed it on the glider, uh, we got no movement on it, and we troubleshot that down to a bad servo assembly. So that glider was sent to Teledyne in Massachusetts in, Dece in early December of 2022. And uh, during our November deployment, uh, Glider 893 suffered a vacuum pump assembly um, malfunction that affected the ability of the glider to maintain its vacuum um, and also uh, its ability to deflate the aft uh, air bladder. It would just continually pump. So that was troubleshot down to the vacuum pump assembly and unit 893 was sent to Teledyne in mid-December of 2022. So unfortunately, we haven't had a glider mission since October. Um, unit 555 tail section is on its way back, so we're going to get that put back together, ballasted 
and hopefully in the water before the end of this month, if not the beginning of March as well. And some of the lessons learned, um, the glider program here uh, at Moat prior to me uh, coming on board, didn't, I couldn't find any documentation for scheduled maintenance plan um, or any pre-deployment checks. So we've implemented those uh, so we can document uh, any discrepancies prior to the deployment. Um, and then when we pull the glider out after recovery, we'll go ahead and we'll do a, you know, a, a post-deployment inspection on the glider as well and document that. Um, and then we're going to put them onto a scheduled maintenance plan. So after every, uh, if it's a 14 day mission, probably after every two missions, um, depending on how it goes, we'll pull them out for scheduled maintenance, check everything over, turn them around and put them back in the water again. And hopefully this will limit the amount of unscheduled maintenance that we have to um, perform on the, on the gliders. All right, so the augmentation of existing uh, harmful algal bloom observing system. So on our um, FIS sensor, <clears throat> we're going to try to, uh, prior to me coming over, the, um, the steps were to create a compact version um, of that particular model. And that compact version would have a smaller version of the waveguide. So the photograph that you see on the right-hand side is the large waveguide. It's uh, about six and a half inches in height, probably six inches in five, six inches in diameter. And that's going to be scaled down to about four inches in height and about three inches in diameter. And that gives us a very lower, um, a lower image, uh, not image, you know, a lower footprint inside a four-inch canister. And we're going to try to do that. So updates on that. Um, we had to install a fourth valve in our plumbing system so that we could uh, implement a methanol reservoir um, so that we could pre-wet the waveguide uh, with methanol. And then we had to update the valve control board, our power control board, and our power uh, our control module board as well. And Carl Henderson uh, was redesigning those circuit boards. We got those boards and he's having some issues ordering the parts. Some parts are obsolete, hard to find. Um, we're still having supply chain issues, um, but we did receive all of the parts. And so those boards have been populated and have been tested. Um, and we're hoping to get that into an operating bench test state very shortly. Um, the, the interesting part is that the new uh, smaller waveguide housing, we can 3D print that here in-house. Um, and then we can also take the actual uh, guide, which we'll make out of uh, Teflon. And we can coil that inside the waveguide here in house also. So we don't have to contract that out to a uh, third party to have those manufactured. We can do it all here in house, which will definitely um, help the cost on that as well. We're going to continue to develop the, uh, uh, the goal is to lower the footprint of the sensor. So the current FIS sensor is uh, eight and a half inches in diameter and it's about 16 inches height. And we're going to bring that down to about four and a half inches in diameter and about 14 inches in height. So the height is going to be just a little bit smaller, but it's going to be more narrow. And currently, the deployment cycle for FizzSense is about 30 days. We have a reference fluid on the inside that will actually run out. And so we have that on a cycle every 30 days. We'll pull that out, repl replenish the um, reference fluid, change the filter if needed, change the screens uh, on the pumps. Um, check all the plumbing, check the O-rings, replace O-rings as needed, um, and then redeploy it. And we were building our third FIS sensor so that as we pulled one out of the water, we could put uh, a third sensor in so we didn't need our data stream on that as well. Um, unfortunately, we haven't been able to do that. So, But we do have data from our new pass sensor. So what we're looking at here is the similarity index uh, of a raw seawater sample as compared against the 19 phytoplankton models that are in the operating system. And this aligns with the GQ strategic goals. So the GQ's mission as depicted in your strategic goals uh, is to provide information about the Gulf's uh, coastal and open ocean water systems that's accurate, reliable, and, and benefits people, ecosystems, and the economy. I'm sure I don't need to tell everybody that. Um, so the data from um, our gliders is available on the GQ's Gandalf website. Um, Bob Curry has been fantastic in getting our data uh, updated on that. And our FIS data is also available on the Moat Cool Cloud website um, with a web address there, uh, coolcloud.moat.org, that anybody can go into and look at. And it'll pull up the um, data analysis console that you see on the screen here. Um, and that's where we're looking at the similarity index. 
Um, the simulated area index gives us uh, a range from zero to one, zero being no similarity and one being complete similarity. And with manipulation of this data console, um, we can accurately see spikes that correlate with the physical cell counts that are being conducted uh, here at Moat. And if we know the actual date and time of the sampling for the physical cell cats, then we can go back into the data and we can pull up um, that exact point uh, in time and create a new phytoplankton model and determine the similarity. And the similarity has been on average uh, almost 0.8 on the, on the index with that. Um, and this is useful in um, predicting uh, how long the bloom may last. Um, it's also a very good indicator in uh, when the bloom will be uh, decreasing as well. It's something that uh, my ocean engineer Riley and I are uh, continually learning uh, on a daily basis. This is kind of new to us and it's a very steep learning curve, but we are getting the hang of it and it is very fun to do. So we are there. So the area uh, of the strategic plan that these funded projects closely align with um, is within key focus area number three, the healthy ecosystems and living resources. Um, with our gliders and our FIS sensors, we are able to collect information that tells how healthy the water quality is. Um, and the abundant data is made available in order to assist in the decision-making processes about ecosystem, uh, ecosystem management as well. And this, ability to have a static and a mobile platform um, helps Moat advance um, the monitoring capabilities in the Gulf. Um, so the gliders can be deployed or rerouted during a deployment to uh, investigate potential hotspots. Um, so the combination of the two gives us more um, detection capability. And the FIS-C uh, will hopefully gain uh, length of time in deployment. So going from 30 days um, upwards of 40 days as well. And a longer deployment time means uh, less data loss during maintenance uh, as well. And the, the glider FIS, which is currently under review for uh, a project submission, um, we're trying to take the FIS and actually fit it back into a glider. I think the OPD was originally um, put into a glider. Pardon me. And then the dimensions of the glider have changed. Uh, so working with Riley, we are looking at the possibility of 3D printing our own fiber, carbon fiber hull section that we can um, fit our FIS sensor into and then fit that into the body of a glider. And if we could do that, then we would have even more ability um, for uh, detection capability. Um, it, gives us an, it would give us an offshore monitoring ability uh, that we don't currently have, um, which would then uh, subsequently allow uh, for timely and rapid deployment for any mitigating technologies that are being developed or have been developed as well. All right. So for us here at Ocean Technology uh, with GCUS, um, we are going to continue um, future iterations of the FIS. Uh, I'd like to see if I can get the sensor to actually quantify concentrations uh, of Karenia brevis. I think that would be a fantastic uh, um, bit of information and the data from that would be um, uh, just immense um, and immensely useful as well. Um, we're going to try to expand um, the monitoring and detection network, uh, hopefully um, put a fizz on an offshore buoy uh, so we can have a static on the um, near, you know, on the, the, the boat dock, uh, one in a sterile bay, we can have one on a glider and then we can have one on a buoy offshore um, and we just have this nice detection network um, that would be out there. Uh, it just seems to be the, the logical progression in, in my mind of, of where we should take this. Um, and then we want to do an expansion of our glider missions. So it'd be really nice if we could have our gliders uh, stay out for more than 14 days at a time. Um, so as we ramp those missions up and we get more proficient in uh, glider piloting and we have the equipment and the assets, uh, we're not waiting around, we're at the mercy of Teledyne Web, um, then we can actually you know, can, uh, conduct those missions and gather that data. And then I can bother um, Mr. Courier more, trying to get even more data up on the Gandalf website. Um, so I believe that, uh, you know, the advances in technology uh, mean that we can, we might have the opportunity to replace the waveguide with a flow cell, um, which would lower the internal footprint um, of the plumbing and the fluidics as well. Um, but it would give us uh, an enhancement in the detection capabilities. 
And so this is the the idea that I have um, for where the you know how the network might look um, with a static sensor and a glider and a surface buoy, all of these uh, working in concert with one another, and then sending the the data back, um, and and being able to present that to the public in a manner that would be um, easy for them to understand and um, easily accessible as well. And that, my friends, is all I have put together for you today. Um, I'm going to click out of that and stop sharing my screen. And I will open it up to any questions if anybody uh, would have one. Thanks so much, John. Um, no problem. Questions? Thanks so much for the opportunity. Go ahead. So thank you very much for the opportunity. My pleasure. I'm going to be a bad moderator because I don't see any hands up and I do have a couple questions for you. So no I'll problem. ask the first one. I'm curious. Oh, oh, go ahead, Tuomo. I see your hand up. Yeah, hi. Um, that was very interesting. So I've been working with um, imaging flow cytobots before. Mm -hmm. I yeah. don't know how familiar you with those uh, for detecting um, different types of algal blooms. Um, so Regarding these FIS uh, sensors, how well are you able to detect a certain species with them, regard, uh, considering there are so many, su such an abundance of species? Um, so there is. Like, uh, how confident can you be that now you are detecting a species? That, that is uh, that's a, that's a really good question. And that was one of the questions that I had coming on board here, which is one of the reasons why um, I have gone back into the, to the data and I'm in the process of um, going back to the, to the exact point in time of the physical cell counts, excuse me, and trying to um, match the spike in the phytoplankton models uh, with those physical cell counts. And right now uh, I've been able to get it at, at an average of about 0.8 on the similarity index um, for Karenia brevis. There are false positives that uh, will show up based on the, you know, the combination of pigments from other types of phytoplankton. And the phytoplankton models that we have, there's only 19 of them in there. Um, and they are the original models from when uh, it was built. So I don't know how the, um, the physiology or the morphology of the phytoplankton changes over time. So that needs to be updated as well. Um, that's on the to-do list. Uh, also, but that's a really good question, and that is something that I'm actively looking into. But to specifically answer your question, uh, about 80% positive on that. That's very good. Thank you. You're very welcome. Yeah. Philemon, go ahead. Uh, I, I might have missed it, but uh, do you happen to have a uh, some sort of a website where we can see the uh, daily readings? If, if any, or the most recent readings? From... Uh, yes, we do. Um, it's in one of the slides. It's actually, uh, it's an HTTPS, and then it's um, moat.org. Uh, uh, let me pull it up. It's moat. It's coolcloud.moat.org. Cool okay. Yeah. So you can go in there, and, and it's open to the public. You can go in, you can manipulate the analysis console as well. Um, and see it and see how it works. It's it was a, it's a little hard uh, to understand at first, but when you go to that website, there is actually a manual that you can read as well, um, and that will show you what how you can manipulate the data that's in there. Oh, this looks this site really looks cool. Thank you. You're very welcome, John. I'm curious. Have you been working with the underwater glider user group in the Gulf already? Is that new to you, or with it your is work new to down me. south? Um, yeah, we have been uh, in touch with, uh, so I, I've, I've coordinated with um, uh, USF, Lynch. Chad Durkee. Oh, Chad, okay. um, so I've spoken to him a couple times as well. Um, and I have been invited into the glider group for GQS. Unfortunately, every time there was a meeting, uh, I had a fire to put out. Um, but I also, I did go through glider pilot training with a um, fantastic individual, Uchenna. Um, and he and I got along really well. Fantastic individual there. Um, Jiku's got really lucky. I had bringing him on board. So um, hopefully he'll he'll go on to do great things as well. 
we sure did. It's just, it's a real practitioner's focused group. So I, th I think it would be a, a really good connection at going forward in your new role at Moat. Um, oh, I Tuomo, agree, I agree. Have, Tuomo, did you have another question or is your hand still up from before? Okay. Sorry, it was the old, old hand. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Um, I, I guess I had one other question too is, um, I saw how far down in Estero some of your centers are. Were you working with the Sanibel Captiva Conservation Foundation at all? Yes, ma'am, we are. Um, but we were actually piggybacking off of their um, pylon mount. So we were able to install our equipment on, on their mount. Um, and they would go out and check on it for us. Or if we, you know, there was a couple of times since I've been on board that we went down um, and, and checked on theirs as well. They were really, really busy after the hurricane. Um, so when our divers went down to recover our sensor, um, we actually went out and, and verified that theirs was still in place as well. Unfortunately, they had all topside control loss as well, um, but their um, subsurface sensor was still in place and still intact, um, didn't suffer any catastrophic loss. So yeah, we do work with them very closely. I know they lost a lot with the recon system down for quite a while after the storm, and so they're facing a lot of the same challenges. Yes, they did. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions. Jen, are you seeing anything else that I'm missing? Oh, Code, go ahead, Code. Yeah. Uh, hey, John, great presentation, by the way. Thank you. Um, you may have mentioned it, and I may have just spaced out and missed it. Uh, when's your next deployment scheduled for? I don't have one scheduled because I don't have a glider back yet. I have a tail section. It's, um, the, the repair has been finalized, and it's en route. So once I get that back, put the glider back together, get it ballasted, I'm going to get it out as soon as possible. I hope it would be, I was hoping it would be next week, but I don't have it back yet. If I receive it this week, that's a possibility. So it looks like probably first week of March, All right. if I get it back in time. Any other questions right. for John? We're coming up on the hour. All right. Not hearing any. Well, thanks so much. Um, thanks to our speakers, Philemon, John. That was really interesting and informative. I also want to take the moment to, a moment to Jen, to thank Jen um, for her technical support. You don't see her, but she's been instrumental in making sure everything goes smoothly for us today. And our communication support from Nadine Slimak. Um, I also want to thank all of you for joining us today. Really appreciate your time. We hope to see you next week. We're going to have a one and a half hour session focused on HF radars. We'll be hearing from Ben Williams and Kerry Wilden from FUGRO and from Stephen Howden from the University of Southern Mississippi and from Uchenna and Tony Knapp from Texas A&M's Geochemical and Environmental Research Group. So until then, be well and thanks for joining.